Welcome to Process to Profitability, a podcast all about the tools and strategies you need to serve your clients and grow your small business, hosted by me, Samantha Mabe of Lemon in the Sea. Join me as I chat with creative entrepreneurs and small business owners about how they built and grew their businesses and how you can do the same in a way that fits you. Let's get started. You're listening to episode 156 of Process to Profitability. Creating content for your business can feel overwhelming and often like you're throwing spaghetti at a wall in hopes that something will stick. Instead of trying everything you hear about online, it's important to create your content based on your values and strengths, which is what Zoha Abbas is joining me to talk about today. We talk about hustle culture and working in a way that works for you. We also talk about the importance of having an aligned offer and finding your strengths as a communicator when creating content. Zoha also shares the important things to consider when creating and sharing content that connects with your dream clients. Zoha is a values-based business coach who is out to kill hustle culture one client at a time. She helps coaches create aligned offers and communication plans so they can share their work with joy, ease, and integrity. If you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful, make sure to check her out and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Hi, Zoha. Thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. We did a bio before the show, but I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit more about who you are, where you're from, and how you got started in your business. Yeah, absolutely. So I am Zoha Abbas. I run a company called The Ownership Method, and um, I like to say that it is my mission to kill hustle culture one client at a time. Um, And I came to small business in sort of, it was almost like a weird backwards sort of way. Um, I come from like a marketing and advertising background. I spent almost a decade in advertising um, as a copywriter. And I got into that industry because I thought, oh, it's going to allow me to be creative. Um, I'm going to get to be around all these amazing ideas. I get to use my brain. I get to, um, you know, get paid for creative expression in a certain sense. And... I got into it and it was like almost immediately every single night until 3 a.m. being at the office, working weekends, people around you sort of being like out to get you um, in a certain sense where there was like a very, very strong sense of competition. Um, There's also a very, very high value in that industry placed upon things like awards and, um, you know, how big the accounts are that you're working with, which, you know, yeah, it does affect the bottom line. But there was so much of a focus on that, that it almost started taking away from the work that we were doing for clients. And the further I got into it, I was just like, I just became so, um, first of all, I became so miserable just from having to be awake so much of the time, (laughs) um, not being able to sleep. Um, I was taking really, really poor care of myself. Um, I, you know, was eating horribly. You eat so much sugar and like salt when you're trying to like stay awake, you know? Um, And we even coined this term at the last place I was at is we would reach for the quote unquote stress Cheetos. Um, So I was eating a lot of stress Cheetos, a (laughs) lot of like really sugary iced coffee, uh, stuff like that. Um, And I finally hit this wall where I was like, I am so sad every single day. I love the creative aspect of my work. I love being able to sort of solve a puzzle. You have to be creative within a certain certain kinds of parameters. I loved that aspect of it. But I was getting sick myself. I was watching my coworkers get sick. I was hearing so many stories of people who had friends in the industry that had full on died from cardiac arrest because of overwork. And it 
it became very, very important to me to be able to have complete autonomy over the way that I work um, and also to be able to advocate for people so that they can also be in charge of the way they work. Um, and so that's how I came to this business. I started the business while I was still working in agencies, sort of built it up over time and then took the leap at the end of 2019, right before, you know, the mini apocalypse hit. <laughs> um, but I still don't regret it. I, I, I love what I do. I love why I do it. And um, I'm glad that I'm here, even though it's been a nutty, you know, two years. Yeah. And I know that, you know, you said that the hustle culture there was so ingrained. And I think yes, many of us come from backgrounds where it's just always working and you just, you dread getting out of your car when you pull up to the oh, building yeah. in the morning. Oh my gosh. Yes. And then we get into entrepreneurship and there's also this same idea that you have to be working all the time. I know when I started, like I was trying to work a regular nine to five hours or even more yeah. than that. And, you know, you just feel like, oh, I have to do this to keep up. And yeah. I love that you are really trying to tell people that we don't have to do it that way. A hundred percent. We do not. We absolutely do not. And I think it's, it also sort of gets glorified, you know, that it's like, oh my gosh, like I worked so many hours and my client roster is full and, you know, whatever, like you're, you're constantly pushing yourself to the extreme. And I hear all these stories where it's like, I had a, you know, a, my first million dollar year, which that is a whole other conversation where we're going beyond the idea of the six figures into the seven figures into the eight figures, right? In all of the marketing that we see now. But seeing the stories of I had my first million dollar year and it took so much out of me, but I'm so proud of myself. And I'm over here thinking, if it actually pushed you so far over the edge that you are getting ill, that you are um, getting like, it, it, just again, that idea of like that full misery of waking up in the morning being like, why am I doing this? Um, you know, pushing yourself to the point of exhaustion, just to hit some kind of number that, you know, if you didn't end up making a million dollars that you probably still would have been fine. Um, that it, it turns my stomach, to be honest, it really turns my stomach because like, don't get me wrong, like, I, I want to make just buckets of money. I do. I want to make a lot of money. I love money. I think it's a beautiful resource. I think it is something to be used and to be shared and to be made and all of that stuff, right? But I think when the money comes at the cost of our mental, emotional, physical, spiritual health and sense of self, it is not freaking worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you mentioned there that people use that in their marketing, especially when they're trying to like sell you on whatever it yes. is that you can learn from them. So yes. I'd love to know how you see that hustle culture showing up in marketing so that maybe we can pinpoint it when we see it and, you know, say, okay, I, I recognize this and I can yeah. see it for myself. Yes. Okay. So I feel like hustle culture is such an, um, sometimes it's really, really overt, but most of the time it's a very insidious thing. And like I mentioned, you know, this idea of the, that hustle and grind, it gets really, really glorified. And because it does take, you know, a certain amount of work that feels hard, right, to, to work on yourself and to work on your business and to solve these problems because it does take that kind of work. We have turned it into the idea of like working hard, right? Like you need to work hard in order to have a successful business. And um, it just sort of permeates into everything. So let, let me talk about a few like really specific examples. Um, like I said, it's very insidious. It can be very manipulative. So things like the idea of creating false senses of urgency, right? 
um, where you see something and there is like um, a countdown timer on something that like the cart is going to reopen again next month or whatever, something like that, right? And sometimes there's a very real, like a limited amount of spots. Like I do VIP days, I have, you know, maybe two to three spots a month on the outside maximum that I can do. For me to say, hey, there's two spots left this month, but it'll be open again next month is very, very different from me being like, there's two spots open and then they're gone, right? And you create this sort of false sense of urgency of like, almost, you're, you're almost doing something to snatch that person's um, ability to make a clear, confident decision away from them. So false senses of urgency, um, even those uh, pop-ups that will be like, oh, get like, you know, 15 recipes for, you know, just your email, whatever the thing is. And there's like a yes button that's like, yeah, I want recipes. And then there's a no button that instead of being something like, no thanks, or not right now, it's something like, no, I don't want to learn how to cook better on Tuesday nights or something like that, where it's like, you're literally making people feel stupid for mm -hmm. deciding not to get the thing that you're offering them. And when I see stuff like that, and it's like, it's almost like a personal attack on a, on a person's sense of self, right? And like that, that sort of like agency and autonomy that we have to be able to trust ourselves to make the decision that we need to make in any given situation, it takes that self-trust away where it's like, oh, like, is it really stupid of me? Like, if I don't get this, like, it's free, right? Why don't I just get it? And also, that's another person's email list that you have just joined that's going to be sending you newsletters all the time. They now have your information, so it's not a completely free thing. I get inbox overwhelm. I don't know about you, but I, I get super overwhelmed sometimes by the amount of newsletters and stuff that I've subscribed to. So I'm very, very picky about what I'm going to say yes to or no to in terms of, you know, freebies and signing up for newsletters. Um, but if I wasn't already like confident in the fact that I can trust myself to make a right decision, if I felt insecure in that in any way, shape or form, that kind of manipulative, uh, manipulative language, um, strategically placed manipulative language, especially, um, it creates this feeling of like, you must, and you have to, and you had better. And that is where the hustle sort of seeps into everything. Um, because the hustle is so like closely related to things like, you know, racism, patriarchal standards, um, there is this idea of manipulating people and forcing people to behave a certain way in order to um, uphold systems that benefit the people at the top and don't allow anybody else to thrive. So um, that's how it shows up in marketing. It's, it's constant, 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 both from the end of the person receiving the marketing and also on the end of people creating the marketing because you have to do it all the time, right? So it, there's so many ways that it shows up. Yeah, I know I have talked a lot with websites specifically about you don't need deadline timers and all these funnels and pop-ups and complicated things in order to sell yeah. what you do. You just need to communicate what it is that you offer and who it works for and then yeah. allow people to make that decision without the pressure. Yes. But it's so hard because we see it works. It works when you, it, it when you push all these yeah. things. So we think that's what should happen in our own business. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like, this goes back to that million dollar thing where it's like, it works, but at what cost? What am I perpetuating what am I creating for myself in my own business right now by behaving in this way? And what kind of harm am I doing to 
my clients, my potential clients, anybody who's interacting with my marketing, like, what is the cost of me, you know, putting some, putting a, a countdown timer on my page, which effectively just raises people's blood pressure to such a degree yeah. <laughs> that they can't think straight. So you're almost like hurting them like they're just stupid pack animals, right? It's, it's, it's I mean, I think about it, it's like, it's almost insulting. It's not almost insulting, it is insulting. Because you just assume that people are so stupid, right? When you're, when you're talking to them in that way, when you're interacting with them in that way. So does it work? Yeah, because I think that, you know, human behavior is a complicated thing and we have certain triggers that can drive us to behave in certain ways. And also, what kind of harm are we perpetuating and what is the cost of that quote unquote working for your business? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we all just need to think about, you know, do we really want clients or subscribers that we pressured into hiring us or buying from us or we want yeah. people who genuinely are excited and ready they feel like this was the right next step instead of oh I have to do it now because you know it's the last yes. spot that's available that's such a good point because that also brings up like the harm that we do to ourselves <laughs> when we're using these kinds of tactics because when you have clients that are not as committed to the work that you both are partnering to do, right? Like when you're, when you're coaching, when you're providing a service, you know, even if it's something like a haircut, like if the other person is not as committed to this process, like we've all seen the videos of like kids who are getting their first haircut. They have no idea what they're getting into. This person is coming at them with a pair of freaking scissors, right? They're getting bits of themselves like hacked away and they're wailing and crying and squirming and it's a bad experience for the kid and it's a bad experience for the stylist. It's a bad experience for the parent. And I know we have to cut our kid's hair. Like that's not the point of this total just tirade. Like my point is that you're going to have tension you're going to have even more of those like requests for reimbursements, people returning things. You're going to have people questioning whether or not your expertise is actually that. I can remember so often, because this is the way that agencies a lot of times like they had to operate, right? Because um, I think I think the industry as a whole is sort of, it's really shifting and really, really changing. And the end user has so much more control, which is a great thing. Um, and it also means that um, agencies really need to justify their existence and that expenditure. So it would be sort of this like manipulative, like orchestrated pressuring into purchasing some sort of whatever retainer or package. And then you constantly have clients that are then questioning whether or not you know your shit, right? And whether or not you're actually doing the thing that is right for them because somewhere in their mind, they know that they didn't completely make this decision on their own. They didn't 100% actually buy into the service that you're trying to offer them. So it creates really, really crummy client relationships as well. And that only hurts your business, not only for that particular client relationship, but they're gonna go tell all their friends like, oh yeah, I hired such and such person and we did this kind of work, but it wasn't really worth it, right? So it ends up hurting future business as well. So is that really something that you wanna create in your business just to make a quick buck? When I mean, know you work with your clients to kind of figure out a way that works for them. So what does it mean when you say work the way that works for you? Yes. Okay. Great question. When you are working the way that works for you, it means you've got your eyes on your own paper. You're listening to your own intuition, you're listening to your own uh, knowledge and expertise, and you don't, you're not looking around comparing yourself to other people around you. So that means, you know, working with your natural energy. Yeah, we're all human beings and 
for the most part, we're all wired to be awake when the sun is up and asleep when the sun is down. Um, but like all of our natural rhythms, like our circadian rhythms, all of that, like they're, they're a little bit different from each other, right? So for example, me waking up at 5 a.m. and going for a run, right? And then uh, meditating for an hour before I drink my green juice, that doesn't work. That's not how I'm wired. That is not what my morning routine looks like, right? Like I am not buns in seat by like 8 a.m. and then signed off by 4 p.m. That's not how I do it. But if that works for somebody else, 100% they should do that without having the pressure of looking at other people and saying, oh, but they do it like this. So that must be the way to do it because they're successful, right? And that's how they're doing it. It doesn't matter. Does it work for you really? Or is it something that you're just doing because you think you're quote unquote supposed to? So that's really the, the deep seed of working the way that works for you. I think that is really important for people to remember. And I, like I mentioned, I, I came from a background where I worked like a regular nine to five. And so that's what I did when I started my business. My husband was at work for his hours. So I thought I had to sit and work. And then we had our first kid and I realized like, I can't sit here from eight o'clock to five o'clock every day. That's not going to work. And I have fully embraced taking a nap when he takes a nap and like, that's what works for us. And yeah, it means that I don't work, you know, all those hours in my business, but I get more done in the time that I do work because I'm doing it in a way that fits my schedule and my lifestyle and everything else I need to do. That is so awesome. Yeah. And I think about this like meme or saying that was like going around I feel like I saw it more the end of last year, but the idea that, quote unquote, we have the same hours in the day as Beyonce or whatever, you know, we have the same 24 hours in the day as Beyonce. <sighs> like, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't have all of the resources she has. I don't have the team that she has. I don't have the background and the expertise that she has. I don't have the amount of money that she has in order to solve problems like I do not and therefore the 24 hours that I have look very very different from Beyonce's 24 hours right so it's so much about like being um I don't want to use the word realistic because I think that sounds kind of like harsh and like overly masculine I think I want to use the word like compassionate, like be compassionate about with yourself about what resources you really have. And that comes down to like energy resources, time resources, physical resources like money and, you know, network connections, whatever, like be kind and compassionate with yourself about what you have to work with and you will be able to do so much more from that space than you would trying to do it like somebody else who doesn't live your life, doesn't have what you have, right? And, and honestly doesn't have anything to do with what you're really trying to do in your life and your business. Yeah. Going off of that, you know, we're trying to figure out what works for our life and our business. Why is it that you really tell people that they need to have an offer in their business that feels aligned with themselves. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this goes back to like, first of all, that idea of like the manipulation and what kinds of client relationships that makes for you. But there's also like a very practical level to this, that if something feels out of alignment, it doesn't really feel that exciting to you. Right. And when you're not excited about something, you're not really going to share about it. Like, I feel like I've come up with so many offerings in my business because somebody has said, oh, you need a whatever kind of offering, right? Like you should try a, a group, you know, coaching program, or you should have a long six month package or whatever. And I, I would kind of go with it for a second because 
I thought that that is the way that a coaching business is supposed to be constructed, right? Um, but those things were not aligned with the way that I like to show up for people. Um, and the way that I built them felt so disjointed just to my natural energy and the way I want to show up and provide service and be present for people that I would flat out just not share my offers. <laughs> and I therefore would make zero dollars. Um, so I feel like there's this added thing of like when an offer is out of alignment for you, not only are you creating just a world of hurt in terms of having to deliver on things that just feel like a slog, right? Bringing in clients that are not the right fit for your business and your energy, um, you know, accidentally perpetuating harm you know, to yourself and the people around you, there's also just this aspect of like, you are not going to be excited about what you have to offer. And you're just not going to offer it. <laughs> and when you do offer it, you're going to like regret that somebody, you know, even signed up <laughs> to like be a client. And you're just going to be like resentful the whole time. You know what I mean? So it's like, I feel like you really, really need to know what's important to you. And you need to know like how your energy functions and what you want to not offer in the sense of like, you know, there's going to be Zoom calls and there's going to be worksheets, but like offer in the sense of like your energy and your um, just the brilliance that you have to give. Um, because if you don't come from those places, you just have like a big unclear, vague like gobbledygook of an offer that maybe somebody buys. And if they do, then you're resentful and it's just icky and sad. <laughs> yeah. That's a great test because so many of us have been there. We've created something, maybe somebody buys it and we're like, Oh, I actually have to do <laughs> Damn this it. Thing. Yes. To, like build this giant project or work yes. with these people for so long. Yeah. And that's a, I think that's a really good test of if you're not excited to even share it, then yes. it's probably not a great offer for your business. A hundred percent. So, you know, when I work with my clients, we really, really work to make sure it's something that not only feels exciting in the sense of like, oh, I could make X amount of dollars with this offer, but it also feels exciting in the sense of, oh my gosh, I get to do this with people. Like I, this is what I do for a living. This is amazing. So I think it's, it's so important. It's so important. Yeah. So when we start talking about creating content for our business, mm -hmm. why is it, well, why is it important to kind of know how our, we communicate and how do we figure out what our communication style and strengths are so that we can start from that place? Yeah. So um, this goes along with the idea of like creative flow. I think I think a lot of your listeners can relate to having been in that space where they're doing something and you just sort of get lost in the moment, right? Um, and it feels energizing. You're, you finish up whatever you're doing. You don't feel drained. Um, I feel like that's something that we must, as small business owners, apply to the way that we show up for our audience because there is so much um, that can be required with marketing a business. Um, we want to make it as easy on ourselves as possible to show up as genuinely and authentically as we possibly can and to actually be excited and happy when we do show up. So I feel like um, finding your communication style. Um, there are a few tools that I like to use with my clients. Um, one of them is the Fascination Advantage Assessment by Sally Hogshead. It's a really, really cool assessment. Um, and it talks all about like kind of how you best show up and relate to other people in the world. Um, for example, I'm a passion personality. So my strength in communication is like 
warm, friendly, personal, emotional connection, right? Like, I, I will get excited about the things that you are excited about, and that, like, helps us connect. And that just is a natural way that I like to relate to people, because I think the things that excite you should be like exciting to other people. It's like a thing to be celebrated because it's like, it's a cool thing about you, right? It's a wonderful, unique, um, special thing about the person that's sitting in front of you. So that's one of the ways that I relate to the people around me. Right. And I use that in my marketing. Um, the videos that I do are not super duper polished. Um, they're, you know, they can be super sloppy. I will curse a lot because the words will just come out of my mouth and I don't bother editing. Um, and I get very, very enthusiastic and animated about things because that just is a way that I exist in the world. So if you can think about, you know, the way that you would relate to a, a friend that you really, really get along with really well and how comfortable it is just for you to be yourself and to communicate however you guys communicate with each other. Um, I think you can sort of start finding the little seeds of like, you know, oh, um, I like to I like to laugh a lot with this person, right? So maybe humor is something that really helps you connect with other people. Or I like to really, really be present and be quiet and just listen when I'm with this person, right? So maybe, you know, that is part of the way that you connect and communicate with people is to invite them to, um, to be the people who are bringing the conversation to you so that you can hold the space for them there. And this kind of blows out further even into the types of platforms that you use, you know? Are you going to be using a written platform and do a a blog or a newsletter? Are you uh, more of like a video person? And are you going to be showing up on things like Reels and on TikTok and on YouTube? Um, are you more of a, um, a person who it's important that you share your professional training and um, any sort of like, um, like accolades, awards, uh, certifications, any of that kind of stuff? you know, is LinkedIn maybe a great place for you because you can really, really um, sort of let your expertise shine on that platform. Um, so there are so many different ways to sort of tailor your marketing to you, regardless of, you know, what people say are the latest trends, you know, what new platforms are coming out. It's so important to understand, like, how do I best communicate? Because that's also how you're best going to market. Marketing is just that. We're just communicating. We're just sharing about our offers, right? So you understanding your communication style is such a big part of that. That's really helpful. And I know that when we think about marketing, especially there are so many people telling us we need to be here or we need to be doing reels and videos and all these different things. So thinking about where we can best communicate is really helpful because if we're not comfortable on video and we, if we are somebody who just likes to listen, video is probably not going to be a great place to show up on TikTok dancing around. And <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's draining for us and it's really not going to come across as authentic when people yes. are watching it. Yeah. And people know, you know what I mean? Like people can tell when you're not being authentic with the way that you're showing up. I mean, even think about this in like a social situation where it's like you're in a big, you know, you go out in a big friend group and somebody introduces you to somebody and they're like, oh, this is, you know, my work friend or whatever. And you immediately get like a weird vibe off of them. And and you can tell that they're trying really hard to be a certain way. And that's not a judgment on on that person, but it becomes difficult to, you know, to trust them. And there's so much vulnerability involved with going to somebody and saying, hey, I'm having this problem. I need your help. 
And that's what basically clients are doing when they come to you and ask for your service, whether it is copywriting, you know, art direction, website building, coaching, whatever the case may be, they're having to be super duper vulnerable and say, I can't figure this out by myself. I'm having a lot of problems and I really need your help, right? So when you show up authentically and you show up as just really in all your you glory, right? People are going to be able to say like, oh yeah, like I know what Zoha's about. I know what her vibe is. I know what she does. I know how she helps, right? And I can tell that, you know, she's showing up in a way that um, is just open and inviting connection, right? Because I'm not trying to like be somebody or do a certain thing with the way that I'm showing up, right? Um, it allows people to sort of come into that space, that opening um, that you've created by being yourself and be able to say, hey, if you're out here, you know, being honest about what's going on with you, let me connect with you and be honest about what's going on with me and maybe you can help me. When we're putting together our content and we've kind of figured out where we need to be and how we best communicate, are there any other tips or ideas that you have for people to make sure that it's really connecting with their dream clients as they create this to put out in the world? Yeah. Okay. That's such a great question. Okay. So I think first of all, like getting very, very, very clear on what your like your offer's actual promise is, I think is so, so important. And then also putting it in a way that your clients would actually talk about it, right? Um, So I think this is gonna come down to, even if you're not doing like, I don't always like to use the words like client research because Mm -hmm. it sounds big and scary. And I think sometimes the type of, quote unquote, client research that has been foisted onto small business owners ends up being us filling out a worksheet about our best friend, Mm -hmm. right? Like, (laughs) like, where does Nancy Drew get her coffee? And what color are her sweaters? And how many dogs does she have? Right? (laughs) I think when you're when you're out to solve a problem, you have an idea of what the issues and what the thoughts are that are going through people's heads that would even relate to having this problem that you can now pop up and say, hey, I have a solution. So when you're looking at talking to your ideal clients, I think it's really, really important to have that empathy and the same compassion that I talked about, like having for yourself, to have that empathy and compassion for the people whose thoughts you do understand or else you wouldn't be here with a solution. And to talk to people from that space, um, I think that is what brings in like the ideal, absolute best energetic fit clients. You don't have to make it complicated. You don't have to make it manipulative. You just have to um, somehow communicate hey, I get what you're going through right now. And I know that it super sucks. I've got this cool thing and it's here for you if you want it. I think that's helpful and to just think about, you know, and, and our job is to just put it in front of people. We can't make people buy. We don't yeah. want to manipulate them into it. So our yeah. job is to just get it in front of the right people with yeah. a message that's going to resonate. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And this has been such a, like a practice for me as well. Like, sort of like holding things loosely, right? And not having this clutch on my financial goals and my client goals and using that to spur on, you know, the idea of like, let me get people to sign up for what I'm offering. It's it's like, I need to trust that I have a solution that people want and you know, if I have a certain amount of expertise in a thing, I know that a solution is good. And, and being able to trust 
in myself, in my ability, in my capability, and just sort of set, set the gift on the doorstep and let them be the person who opens the door to pick it up instead of trying to like break and enter and, you know, like throw the gift in <laughs> through their living room window or something, which is just like absolutely the most abrasive, like scary thing possible. I think just <laughs> psychologically the way that people can offer sometimes, like it comes across as just shoving something in through somebody's front door, right? I want to be able to just like, set the gift down and say, hey, it's on your doorstep if you want it and allow them to be the person to open the door and pick it up. When we wrap up, I always like to ask people if they could recommend one thing to a friend, what would it be? Oh my gosh. Okay. So um, you pre-sent this question to me. I just want like audience people, like she sent this question to me and I was like, oh my gosh, one thing to recommend to a friend. And I was like, is it going to be like food? Is it going to be a book? Is it going to be makeup? Like, what is it going to be? Right. Um, and when I really sat down and thought about it, literally the do not disturb function on my phone, (laughs) that is the thing that I want to recommend to people. Um, it has changed the way that I show up for my business. Um, And I think this goes back to like that I like part of hustle culture is the constant distraction and like that idea of FOMO and our cellular devices are built to create that so that we stay glued to them. And the do not disturb function for me has been like it, I feel like it gifted back my sanity because I wasn't constantly looking at, oh, I have a notification from Instagram. Oh my gosh, I have an email. Oh my gosh, I have a text message. Um, or even like, oh my gosh, like my mom is trying to call me. Like what, like whatever the case may be. Um, and me having to stop and like text her back and be like, mom, I'm working right now. I will get back to you when I get back to you kind of thing. It's helped my mental health so much. Like just... Put it on do not disturb. Honestly, just turn the phone over and put it face down. Even that is like a freaking game changer. So that's what I want to recommend. I love that recommendation. I have mine on do not disturb after like 10 o'clock. So unless there is an emergency and you've called me like three times, I am not going to hear from you until the next morning. And no text message that somebody sends me is important enough for me to wake up at two o'clock and have to answer. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I also have mine on at night. Um, And just the simple fact that you can also, you can customize like how that setting functions so that if there is an emergency, somebody can get through to you, right? So you can take away that weird thing that we now have because we have cell phones that like, oh my gosh, if somebody like can't get a hold of me 24 yeah. seven, like <laughs> there's going to be some like earth shattering emergency that occurs, right? Um, <laughs> which is like, what did we do when we just had landlines? I know, isn't that funny? If you were out, yeah, like we didn't, nobody even thought about it. But, um, you know, you can sort of, soothe that that part of the brain as well while also still having your sanity handed back to you which I think is beautiful yeah all right so if people want to learn more from you or they want to see how they can work with you where can they find you and connect with you online yes so you can just head to my website at theownershipmethod.com um and i have a new mini course out for you right now um it is called the zero sleazy super easy marketing mini course um so you can just grab that at theownershipmethod.com slash free mini course and get your hands on that it's totally free It's all about how to like show up genuinely, take the hustle out of your marketing um, and show up in a way that is like, it's easy without feeling bad and you can show up excited about your marketing. Awesome. I will link to that in the show notes so that people can check it out. Um, But thank you so much for coming on the show and talking through all of this with us. Yeah, absolutely. This was amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Process to Profitability. 
Please take a minute to leave an honest review in iTunes so that I can help more small business owners and creative entrepreneurs find the show.